there, and welcome to Ancestral Recall. I'm your host, Eli Kaplan. Ancestral Recall is a web series that illustrates 20 years of magic's history. Now, today's episode is going to be something a little different, and this is a topic that I feel is extremely necessary to tackle. Today, we're going to talk about the eras of magic. Now, really, the only person who talks about eras is Mark Rosewater. And while I feel that Rosewater is incredibly frank and honest with how he sees things, we do have to acknowledge that much of what he says and what he sees is from the inside and as a company man. He's in the business of making magic look good, and there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of what he does is political. And that's part of history, by the way. History has always been political. If you want to learn more about this, go read Herbert Butterfield's Wig Interpretation of History to get the whole story about that. Seriously, it's a great book, it's a short read, and it gives you a lot of understanding of what the historian's craft is. So to start off our discussion about magic, we have to start with comic books. Yeah, comic books. Now, comic books have eras. Superman and Batman came from the Golden Age, when the field's boundaries were initially set. Spawn, Youngblood, and the violent, gun-wielding anti-heroes of the 90s were the Dark Age. And comics fans can have productive discussions and save time when they're talking about comics history because they have a shared terminology. There are new comics fans all the time, and if they want to learn more about history, well, there's enough precedent and research out there and criticism that they can get a fairly definitive perspective of the past. There are lots of different opinions by authors and participants, so it's not like anyone gets silenced. But there's a body of information that people understand and can build upon to make their views contextualize. The trends have been identified and critiqued, and that's what I think magic needs. We need eras. We need boxes to put things in so that we can see and talk about a bigger picture without too much clutter. Now, my set retrospectives look inside a single box, and this is something bigger. Please understand that putting time into eras does several things for the field. It is a statement of what matters. What makes one time different from another? That marking shows the values of the writer and may be analyzed by the audience. And I'm not afraid to make mistakes, by the way. Historians make mistakes in documentation all the time, or, you know, questionable arguments. Peer correction is a very prized thing. The picture gets better focus. Another thing you want to know about history is that it's subjective. Videotape isn't, but what people think and what they remember and recount, yeah, that's subjective. Facts and match records, they don't change, but the memories do. And so you have to look at multiple perspectives to get improved analysis. So with that said, let's look at the eras of Magic the Gathering. 1993 to 1995. I'm going to call this era the Dawn of Time. This is Magic at its beginning, with people scrambling to get cards because everything sold out at your local comic book store as soon as it got there. The game underwent a radical shift from Richard Garfield's initial vision because people kept going into stores and buying entire boxes of boosters or starters. To find the original expectation that people would buy a starter and maybe two boosters and have, you know, 90 cards in their collection total. Now, Wizards doesn't have the capacity or networking to print a demand at this point. Some gaming stores had tournaments, and big tournaments happened along with RPG gaming at traditional gaming cons. 1995 to 1996. Submitted for your approval, The Dark Age. Now, between the flooding of the markets with fallen empires... Ice Age and its overly complex commons, Homeland's general awfulness, and the long, long wait between Homelands and Alliances, this was a time of Magic's stagnation. Lots of early players quit during this time and came back at many different points. I myself got out of the game during this era. Many of the cards were underpowered, as Wizards didn't quite have a handle on development yet, and the expectations for the new Type 2 format, or Standard as it's known today, weren't quite formulated. Balancing need of collectors, who were extremely ticked off with the flooded markets of Fallen Empires and then Chronicles, and the needs of the players, was a very tricky thing. But during this time period, Magic also became better established in Europe, seeing print in French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and German. 1996 to 2000, the Bronze Age. Starting with Mirage, Magic shifted into blocks. These blocks were designed for limited play with continuity and focused on a few keywords and the variety they added to the game. This was magic designed for tournament play with a newfound understanding of draft. The power level of new cards crept upwards and the Pro Tour and Grand Prix circuit got a lot of people interested in the game. The game's infrastructure separated from the tabletop RPG world to some degree as players came together to win money and invites to Pro Tours. This was a time when magic became cutthroats 
and the LoV players around the world were able to use rules manipulation and various cheats to become dominant. The DCI was struggling to keep the growing tournament community honest. Mark Rosewater has called this the Wild West of tournaments. And so they needed to develop a judging and organizing community that was uniform in standards and practices and trusted by the player community. In the U.S., East Coast judging culture was draconian, handing out game losses or match losses for accidentally just bumping over top cards of deck at pre-releases. This was in reaction to a player environment with a fair amount of cheating. Now, over time, the DCI trained judges to be more friendly and cooperative with players while still teaching them how to be vigilant and spot dishonest players. The game also spread across the world to Latin America and Asia during this time. Japanese, Chinese, and for a brief period, Korean got magic releases in their language. 2000 to 2008, the Renaissance. This time period is dominated by blocks that provide a distinct mechanical experience. Dominant gold cards and invasion block. The graveyard block, Odyssey. The spirit war of Kamigawa. The metallic artifact plane of Mirrodin. The guilds of Ravnica. This era also features the introduction of magic online. The peak of this era, in my opinion, is Ravnica, City of Guilds, which hits a creative home run by merging two color combinations with an urban, gritty, fantastic city world setting. The Pro Tour Hall of Fame is created, giving veteran pros and community superstars a sense of immortality. The Pro Tour is more of a highlight for the game at its best, and less a brass ring for players to make money. Russian cards also get printed during this time. I am not going to cut this era into two with the development of modern and the 8th edition frames, although many people will. And that's a fair opinion. I was a big fan of the new frames when they came out, by the way, since my eyes are not fantastic and the new ones were easier to play with. 2008 to 2010, the Mythic Age. Shards of Lara brings forth the Mythic Age. This is the point where Mythic Rarity enters magic and totally shakes up the secondary market. Now, by being able to control frequency of highly powerful effects of rares, Wizards has more control over limited experiences, allowing brutally powerful cards to enter constructive formats without bending the limited format out of shape. I personally don't buy Rosewater's claim that it was to meet new players' expectations as they came into Magic from other sets. I mean, for me, Magic was my first game, so that doesn't come to mind for me, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. But anyway, Mythics also create cards in Standard that rise as high as $100, as in the case of Jace the Mind Sculptor. After two years of being on probation since their Lorwyn release, Planeswalkers finally become embraced by Wizards and become staple components of every new set. 2010, New World Order. This era keeps the mechanical experience focus of earlier sets, while also attempting to keep board states slightly less complex, especially in the case of commons. Mark Rosewater says that having a preponderance of onboard effects can cause players to freeze, keeping the game from being an immersive experience. A secondary benefit of keeping board states less complex is enhancing the viability of Duels of the Planeswalkers, a video game available on almost every console and PC that teaches the fundamentals of different magic concepts such as Mill, Red Aggro, White Weenies Fortifying Combat Tricks, Black's Discard and Kill Spells, etc, etc. Cards from newer sets as well as core set staples came together with duels to create an enjoyable gateway experience into magic. M10's innovation of making core sets relevant again by printing new powerful cards got more people to play with Core Set Limited, which also attracted newer players. Also at this time, Magic gets started printed again in Korean, bringing the number of languages up to 10 or 11, depending on whether you separate traditional and simplified Chinese or not. I don't. And where are we today? In my mind, we're still in the era of New World Order. With the new M15 frames coming, will that be enough to create a new era? I doubt it, but who knows the future? Not me. To be perfectly frank, I'm not entirely happy with the names I've used for the different eras, there's no sense of progression, as is the case with the metals used in tools in early human civilization. These labels are evocative, such as the Dark Age following the dawn of time, then followed by the Bronze Age, but you know what? I'm hesitant to call anything the best of all time, so I didn't label anything as the Golden Age. What is the Golden Age? Obviously the best time? Well, that's a matter of opinion. My favorite blocks are Ravnica and Time Spiral, and while lots of people say wonderful things about the former, Time Spiral's verdict is fiercely contested. Does that mean that that's the game's high points? I couldn't tell you. So let's get the discussion going. Do these eras work for you? Let us know. Thanks for watching.
please feel free to comment below. And if you like this video, hammer on that like button. Go back and check my old videos if you enjoyed this, and think about subscribing. This is Eli Kaplan for Ancestral Recall, signing off. Good games, and good luck.